Um, I work, for those of you who don't know, I work with the teams that are down there, and I work and help them to, you know, speak Spanish, because I, I help them translate, and I do, uh, I drive around with them, and driving down there is very hectic, it's like New York City, and then you multiply that by like 10, add some people, and you know, if we ever got snow down there, I would not leave the house, <laughs> I would not, it's just, it just wouldn't be good, <laughs> so... It's been incredible. The, the main, main thing that happened, one of the things that happened last year, we started out, you know, hitting, going really fast, is we started out and we were changing the roof on the mission house. God provided the, the funds that we could provide the, that we could change the roof on the mission house. And at the same time, we have a sponsorship program that right now we have over, thanks to God, we have over 300 children sponsored through our sponsorship program. And it's, a, and it's an incredible blessing. At the same time, we're running around. Uh, while we're changing the roof on the mission house, we're running around, we're buying all the supplies, all the uniforms and everything for these kids. And it was incredible to see, and especially since from the beginning, um, let me go back a little. I don't know if you, all, everybody knows my testimony here. But when I was little, I was about nine years old, and over at Pennsylvania Avenue United Methodist Church, I was sitting there one day and listening to these two missionaries who I now live with, Mike and Glenda Miller, and I was sitting there listening to them talk about Honduras and how there's a mission in Honduras and how they're building on a school in Honduras and how this team from Honduras is coming down and they're going to work on this school. I'm like, that sounds awesome. I'm like, I'd really like to find out about that. So I'm like, okay, nine years old going over. So what do I have to do to be on the mission team? They're like, um, <laughs> you're a little too small. <laughs> I'm like, and where's Honduras? They're like, oh, it's in Central America. I'm like, oops, I thought it was in Africa. <laughs> Anyways, so I was like, all right, that works. So later on, I'm like, okay, you have to be 16 to go on the trip. I'll have to wait a little bit. So then when I was 15, uh, a few of my homeschool friends, um, some of you know, may, may know the Moors, and I know you know the Pearsons, went down on a trip, and I got pretty jealous because I was like, oh, I wanted to be the first one down there. <laughs> so I was like, oh, well, next year. So next year I went on, uh, last year I was actually here speaking when the Pearsons were speaking as well, and it was awesome because they were the ones that I first went down on a mission team with. So... It was incredible to see that, and one of the verses that has really touched me in that way, that was really, while I was going through all that, is Isaiah 6, 8. And in Isaiah 6, 8, it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And one of the crazy things that I, I was always thinking about is, there it says, the Lord is saying, whom shall I send? He's not directly asking you. He's just saying in general, whom shall I send, you know? There's a ton of people out here, but whom shall I send? And Isaiah had the courage, had, had the movement of the Spirit in him to say, I'll go. I'll do it. God didn't specifically call him, but Isaiah stood up and said, no, that is my calling because that is how I feel. And so that's what really motivated me, especially there's a, there's a song, an old hymn called Here I Am, Lord. You guys probably know it. And whenever I sang that, you could really, I could really feel it because all of us have a calling on our lives. Everybody has a calling. God's probably saying in your life, you're seeing this one area you're, and he's saying, whom shall I send? And you're like, well, I mean, that guy over there looks pretty qualified. He could do it. <laughs> or that one. Yeah. I mean, I don't really want to go, but I can certainly help you find a person, <laughs> you know. But he's looking for somebody. He's looking for the spirit to move in you so you can say, that's what I want to do. If you're just entering Christianity, he's looking for you to go deeper in his relationship with you. He's looking for something deeper. Because one of the questions that Mike always asks the teams when he's down there is, who are you? And at first you're like, well, you know, as for me, I'm Ben. You know, no big deal. But no, he's looking for something deeper than that. He's saying, who are you really? And that's what Mike was getting at. Where is your identity in? Is it in Christ? What, what do you identify yourself with? Is it by, you know, the things that hold you back, your addictions? Is that what identifies you? Or are you identified by who you are in Christ? 
And he also, Mike also gives the question, why are you here? And it's kind of weird because, you know, you're down on a mission trip and you're hearing, why am I here? Um, I'm here to help you guys out. I'm here to serve. And he said, no, why are you here? Why are you really here in my house? What is God going to do in your life? How is he going to work? How is he going to work through this identity that you're working out? So, also, while I was going through all this stuff, when I was about 15, you know, I was like a typical teenager. I mean, I was homeschooled, so not too typical. <laughs> but there were a couple things that were, that were really holding me back at that point. One, um, before I went down to Honduras at the age of 15, one thing that was really big, I was having, I was really depressed for some reason. And I was having like thoughts of suicide. At the same time, I was like addicted to pornography. So that year, I went on a youth retreat and I recommitted my life to Christ, which was a big thing. But at the same time, you know, I couldn't get rid of this stuff. I went to an event called Winterfest, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. And there was a speaker called, named Maddie Montgomery who came. And he was talking, and I mean, he preaches really nice. But that day he said, he was talking about some other things, and they came around and he said, you know, my friend named Ben, I have a friend named Ben, and he, he's suicidal the other, he was suicidal the other day. And at that moment, the spirit moved to me. I'm like, hey, my name's Ben, and I'm thinking these things. And in that exact instant, the Lord took everything away, all of that away. And it was incredible. And then to have that experience to go down to Honduras, it put me on fire for missions. It gave me a purpose in my life. It made me realize that my identity is in Christ and to keep moving forward in that. So I went down on several mission teams after that. And when I was 18, my, I was like, well, let's have Mike and Glenda for, for lunch. My dad wasn't able to go, but my mom and my two sisters went. They were up here speaking. So we went out to lunch at Friendly's, and Mike's like, so what do you want to do with your life, Ben? And I said, well, probably go to CCC and, you know, get out the basics. I don't really know what I want to do with my life. And, and uh, my mom was like, well, why don't you take him down and show him the ministry for like two months? And... Mike was like, are you sure you know what you're asking? And my mom was like, no, nah, not really. <laughs> <laughs> so we went, I went down for two months and I really fell in love with the ministry. I was given this passion for this ministry to help out. And ever since then, the year I started was 2015 and I've been down in Honduras for three years now. <coughs> I'm gonna be starting my fourth. So it's been a real blessing to be a part of this ministry. And every year I'm growing more spiritually, getting challenged more to do more. And one thing, like I said, we started out the year very hectic. One thing that uh, really impacted me this year was in Comayagua. Now, I don't think we have some slides here in a second. Yay, there's my face. So the next slide, yes. So in March... We had a big upset in Comayagua, which is a squatter's village um, that the bo our boys youth group ministers in. And there we usually have six house churches. So Mike split the whole thing up into six quadrants and all the boys, the older boys are the leaders and the younger boys, you know, they're, they're there to learn from the older boys. And they create these house churches and they're preaching the house churches. Now, in this community, they're squatters, they don't own the land. So these politicians are thinking, well, their land is a great land to, you know, take over. They're right next to the highway. It'd be great for condominiums. It'd be great for factories and things like that. So they came in with a bulldozer and they took down these people's houses. Now, it was very sad to see when we went in the first time, it kind of looked like a, you know, like a bomb had gone off. The good thing is their trees were not touched their fruit trees that we, that we gifted them, and their wells were not touched. In the past, they went back and forth with the bulldozer and left everything flat. But this time, it was only the houses. So that was the blessing in all of it. And Mike came up with the idea. We went in, and uh, we delivered food a couple times to them, uh, hammer and nails to help them rebuild. And they've rebuilt, and they're in the next slide. They've rebuilt, and, you know, it's not much. That's what they call their home. You know, uh, probably five people live in that house. <laughs> And our sheds up here are probably better than their, their, their little house down there. But it's incredible to see because these people, they have nothing. 
And in, their, in that having nothing, they really rely on God, those who are Christians. And that's really what we, we go to. I mean, yes, they were very sad to see their houses go. But at the same time, they looked forward when we came and visited them. They said, how can you encourage us with the word? Not, you know, how can you help us with things, but give us something to, to help us continue on, to help keep moving on. Because we know Christ is our rock, and Christ will help us move on. And it's incredible to see. I remember one man that was there. It was after all this, and we were just having our house church. And it was like the first time he had come. And he was in there standing in the circle, and Glenda was talking to him. And she was leading him to, to accept the Lord, and the Lord was calling his name. And he, at the same time, he was like, eh, well, he, he, was on, he was on the fence, and he's like, well, I think I'll, no, maybe, maybe some other time. I know I can accept Christ at any time, you know. I'll go home, do it, you know, tomorrow or something like that. And, and Glenda kept speaking to him, and then all of a sudden he said, sister, let me tell you about a dream I had. In this dream, which was ironically last night, amazing how the, word, the Lord works, in this dream that I had, the Lord came back to reclaim those who were his. And he came back, and I realized I wasn't ready. And the terror and fear gripped me inside, and I didn't know what to do. So at that moment, all of a sudden, the Spirit just led him to his knees. He, he went onto his knees and said, I want to accept Christ as my Savior right now. And it's things like that that, that really really touch your heart to see that, to know that God works. He works through your dreams. He'll work through anything to get your attention. And if that's to lead you to Christ, awesome. And then after that, to lead you deeper into Christ, deeper into a better purpose, into a greater purpose than what we have right now. Now, I mentioned the construction teams that I'm involved in, which is the next, on the next slide here. And we got five construction teams last year and one medical team. And right now we're working on a public school, a junior, senior high school. The one that I mentioned last year, we're still in that one. If you'd like to go to the next slide. Those, uh, those are the ones we finished this year. We, have, we now have an office in this public school, which is awesome. We were able to, it's, to help out with the sponsorship program and to distribute materials and things like that. But also the director has been so kind to us. He actually, he was actually up here and was speaking at churches around here. The director of the school, he's never been up here, so he came up here and um, the other day he was out shoveling, I guess. Mike went over to help him snow blow and he's like, is this a big storm? <laughs> We're like, no, not really. <laughs> you know, he's getting out of breath shoveling and he's like, oh my goodness. But he really loved it up here and he was really excited to share about how Border Buddies, how Christ is impacting his school. Because this past year, for example, this past year, Mike was looking out during the Elmira College team. We were observing the kids and wondering how we could help. And an opportunity came up. We realized that the kids down there are kind of like the kids up here. We found one problem that was plaguing them, and that was Facebook. I mean, we don't have a big Facebook problem up here, right? It's not that big. I mean... Not like we don't spend hours on it every day, but. <laughs> so these kids have this Facebook problem. And what they were doing, actually, is they were having two Facebook pages. One of the Facebook pages was saying, hey, look, Mom, I'm a good Christian. You know, I have all these things about God. I have godly friends. And the second page that they weren't showing their parents was completely diabolical. It had pornography on it. It had images of suicide, cutting, whatever you can think of that's like satanic, it was there. And so we decided, well, let's do a, let's do a, an assembly. So we actually ended up doing, I think, seven assemblies over two days. We first went to the teachers and we gave the assembly to them. So we're all on the same page. And it was incredible to see the reactions from teachers. Some of them were against it, but others were for it, because some of them really are addicted to Facebook, just like the kids. And then we did the parents. So over these two days, over all the grades from 7th through 12th grade, we ministered to over 2,000 people. 
And it was incredible because I, I did the PowerPoint for it. We did a lot of investigation. And I actually took the images that were, that were on these kids' Facebooks and put them in my PowerPoint. So we were going through these images, and, and we're like, yeah, so these images, they all came off of your kids' Facebooks. So we have some work to do. And after, after the assemblies, the parents were all in. They, were, they said, yes, we need, to, we need to get in on this. A lot of the parents didn't know what was going on because they weren't into technology and things like that. But the director has let us do that in a public school. He realizes that the only way to change these kids is through Christ. That's the only way that you're going to change these kids and get a real change in your school. Because he sees the kids coming out of Mike's youth group and the other two youth groups that I help out with. Um, Charlie runs the other two youth groups. He's been with Mike since the beginning. He's a Honduran. But they see the change in these kids that are coming in because they are, they're disciplined, they're focused, and they're not you know, all in this other stuff, all in this other garbage. And he realizes, well, if those kids are like that, then we can get the rest of the kids like them too if we just get them all saved. we got to get them focused on Christ. And have that in a public school, I mean, it's difficult to do that in a public school, especially up here. Because people are actually pushing God, as you know, out of the schools. And to have that, it's incredible. But we're still working on the school. In the next slide, um, we're still doing it. What happened is this, this past year, we started to lose some kids from the school because the, there was only two careers there that you can graduate as. When you finish ninth grade, it's kind of like you graduated high school, they say. And the 10th through 12th grade, they consider your bachelor's degree. So when you go into this, you have two options in this school. And this is the better school around the area. One of the, one of the top ones in Tegucigalpa is that you can graduate as finances or computer. Now, for the kids who don't like math, finances is not an option. And for the kids who are not you know, tech savvy, computers is not an option. So they're like, well... I'm done here, I'm gonna to move to a different school. So you're losing kids like that. Well, Mike said, well, if we bring in and we create some laboratories up above, then will you bring in another career? And he said, yes. So we'll be, they'll be bringing in a liberal arts career that you can finish as. And those are what we're building right now is uh, three more laboratories up above to help this school out. There are over a thousand kids that go to this school. And they've, gone, they've come a long way from when we first went in and they were taking a classroom and dividing it in two and putting classes of 50 on either side. So we've really come a long way. And we have also have the medical team, which is in the next slide. Yes. And the medical team saw almost 1,100 patients. And it, it was really incredible. Last year, we saw around the same amount, but we only we had four doctors. This year, we only had one doctor. So he was really working his tail off to get all these people seen. And in the next slide, you'll see we went out to Comayagua as well with this. And this year, we set it up just like we would a school. And the people came to one area instead of us going to them. And it worked out a lot better. And the people out there were able to receive like diabetes medication, high blood pressure medication, and things like that. That and things that they would normally try to buy if they could find it. And some of them can't afford it, so they wouldn't get it. Um, I know for a fact that some people, a lot of people down there, if they can't afford their blood pressure medication, they'll take one one day, and then they'll wait a couple days and take another one. And that's really bad for your health because it makes your blood pressure go up and down and it really messes with your heart very badly. And it was, it was incredible to see how grateful they were. These people that don't have much were thanking us up and down for being there. And we did, we did have um, people that came through with demons. We did have people that were mentally ill that came through. And it was incredible to see and to be able to minister to all of them. And one of the verses, I'd like to read another verse here, is uh, Galatians 4, four uh, 6 and 7. Because verse, verses like these, um, there's another one in like Ephesians 1. 
it just really helps you to see that we do have the power to, to heal people, not just with doctors, but to lay hands on people. And sometimes that's what, as I was saying before, as, as, is what God is calling us to do. And God's saying, well, go lay hands on that. Can somebody lay hands on that person? Not necessarily you. And you're hearing it and you're going, well, that guy's a pastor over there. He can do it. It doesn't matter if he's busy or something. You know, I'm just, you know, wait. But we're all called to lay hands on people. We're all called to be missionaries. Not just me, not just to go to a different country, but everybody here is called to be a missionary. We're called to change whatever circumstances we're in and make them for the best and make them for Christ. So Galatians 4, 6, and 7 says, Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So when we have that spirit and it's calling out, Abba, Father, it's realizing the call that God is saying and moving us to accept that call. And then verse 7 says, You are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also, you are made also an heir. We are no longer slaves. Like me, when I was back in the suicidal thoughts and pornography, I was a slave to my sin. But when I made that change and put Christ at the center, I was no longer a slave but a son of God. And that is for everybody who is in Christ Jesus. Right. All of us are sons of, and daughters of God. And that means we are also heirs to his kingdom. And that through Jesus' name, we can do all things through Christ. Right. So we are called to that. So thank you very much. Um, and the next slide we have, I'm looking for um, some people to consider uh, sponsoring me monthly, but please pray, not just for me, but for the whole ministry. It is an awesome work that's going on down there. And we know that through your help up here, we go down there to minister down there, but we know that you guys are up here also ministering to people up here, doing the work that we can't do because you guys are here all year round. So please remember that, that we are heirs to the kingdom of God. We are heirs and that we are called to do something with our lives, that we are called to be out there. And that's what I want to leave you with today. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Stay up here for a sec, Ben. Uh, so I want to, I want to just give the the invitation again that, that Ben left us with. And uh, you know, sometimes you, you just have opportunities. You have opportunities to sow into something. And, and Ben is an opportunity. You know, someone here today, maybe you feel, you feel stirred up for maybe just a grace for Ben, a desire, something in you to say, there's something that I feel within me compelled to give and support Ben. I want to be a part of what he's doing. I want to take part. That's what sewing does also. It's actually taking part in. When we sew, we actually get to reap something of the Lord. It's really special. There's a, a different kind of economy that God has a adopted us into. And so I just want to make that really clear. Ben is going to be out here um, at a table with information. I, I want to encourage everyone to ask him some questions, find out more. He just gave us a little nugget of testimony and what God's doing. I'm sure there's a lot more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure he would love to share that with you. But I also want to encourage you, if, if you called the sow, if you want to sow, if you want to ask him, go ahead and do that. Uh, make sure you do that. Um, if you even write something out to the church and just put point it to us, but make sure you connect with him and we'll get you the information you need to do that. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you. We want to pray for you, man. And then uh, I have one more announcement too. But let's pray for Ben as he continues to sew. How long are you here for? If you're here for another week or two? Till February 1st. Okay. That's when I fly out. And actually, uh, this is a, a side, but important also, Mike and Glenda Miller are going to be speaking at the Discipleship House this yes, Wednesday night. So for anyone who wants to follow up, uh, maybe you're not familiar with the Elmire Discipleship House, Wednesday night over by the college, Elmire College, he'll be speaking. Um, uh, Mike and Glenda will be speaking. Are you yes. going to be there? I will be there. Good. I'll be there. That's right. There you go. You can hang out with Ben again. If you want more information, <laughs> you can talk to me. But uh, I want to pray for Ben right now. So let's just pray. Father, we bless Ben. We thank you, Holy Spirit, thank you, Lord. for adopting him. Yes, Lord. Father, thank you. You call him son. Yes, Lord. 
Thank you, Jesus, for giving him everything of yourself. Thank you for placing your life in him. And at nine years old, what? (laughs) Nine years old, you were speaking, you were saying something of eternal significance to him. That, that gives me faith. That stirs my faith up to expect more for young ones. Yes. Yes. God, if there's a deposit, maybe that's the deposit yes, for us Lord. today from what Ben shared. Thank you for speaking to Ben. Thank you that you didn't need him to, to understand doctrine or to even really fully understand maybe your love or grace. I don't know. But in your goodness, you spoke to him. Yes. That is really amazing. God, would you speak more to Ben in this season than he's ever heard you before. Would you take him to depths he's never gone before with you and bring abundance and resources that he never even thought he could ask for? That you would get so much glory in his life, God. For the rest of his days, we bless him in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Love you, man.